so now going to the actual uh, meat of the matter or the heart of the matter um, we are going to describe the method of analyzing a, a typical method of analyzing a Peel's logic resonator of the K31, K33, and KP modes. <coughs> the first step is to measure the geometry. Measure the length, the base, the height using a micrometer or a caliber. Uh, measure the radius, then you measure the mass, and therefore you can find the density. You can also use another method called the Archimedes method, where you measure the, the mass of the sample in air and in water, and using some equations you may be able to find online. You can also determine the density that way, which would be a more accurate way. But nonetheless, you need to measure the major dimension of vibration. <coughs> Next, you know, given that compliance data that you, I mean, given the impedance data that you found of resonance frequency, anti-resonance frequency, you can you can calculate the compliance. So the compliance uh, is uh, the resonance frequency or the frequency you use to determine the compliance. I mentioned for the K33 resonator and the K31 resonator are different. So for the K31 resonator, let me just write this out. K31 use the resonance frequency according to the lowest impedance and this will then give you the compliance under constant electric field using this equation here <coughs> and however for the K33 resonator you will need to use the anti-resonance frequency according to the highest z value and that will give you the compliance under constant electric displacement so in order to find actually the uh, uh, compliance of constant electric displacement for the k33 resonator you'll need to find the k squared value as seen in this equation here so s33 E equals SD uh, divided by 1 minus the K, the coupling factor, of this material. And I'll describe how to calculate the coupling factor uh, in the coming slides. But for the KP sample, uh, because its uh, resonance frequency includes both results for the uh, S11 under constant and it also includes effects from the Poisson's ratio, which we're going to call this, because this is the planar Poisson's ratio versus the Poisson's ratio, which are <coughs> which would occur between the one and three direction. Because that, that's how the D three one mechanism works. You you pull in this direction and you may get charged in, in the other direction. So this is a little different. This is a planar. Uh, this is not three one. This is like uh, one and one two, which we call. Uh, but anyways, this is a planar Poisson's ratio, not a thickness-length Poisson's ratio. So you need to use, by measuring the second resonance frequency, which will be prob probably for your sample be the second largest, the next uh, resonance frequency, which is approximately three times greater than your original uh, resonance frequency. So the second resonance frequency is approximately three times greater than F resonance number three. Uh, so once you, or reference is number two, I guess we call it. So if you divide their second resonance frequency by your first one, you get a number Q. And using this Q value, uh, which these are just placeholders, just sort of just go through these polynomial fitting equations, um, you calculate this eta value. And you can also calculate <coughs> a coupling coefficient. So from the frequencies ratio, you can, couple it, you can calculate a coupling coefficient. Not a coupling coefficient, the Poisson's ratio. And using this equation here, then you can calculate the S11 under constant electric field. But effectively, you can't analyze the compliance directly from only uh, the resonance frequency, uh, uh, the first resonance frequency. <coughs> and these relationships are regressions from the table on the IEEE standard. There's a part in the IEEE standard which describes how to calculate uh, different values. It's sort of near the end. And it has actually a table, 
and I just basically fitted a polynomial fit in Excel of this table. So it turns out pretty good. Uh, all right. Next step, we want to determine the coupling coefficient, k. And you can remember the general form of k uh, was d, whatever for whatever value, it could be d31, d33, <coughs> uh, divided by um, the square root of the compliance, uh, not necessarily 1, 1, but it has to be under constant electric field, uh, multiplied by the permittivity under constant stress, which means you're not constraining it at all. So for the K31 resonator, uh, following this equation, you can find K31 squared. Uh, and following this equation, you can find K33. Uh, so you'll notice that K31 is a little more complicated than K33. Uh, and you'll notice also that the resonance frequency, whenever, whenever I'm referring to resonance frequency in these equations, I mean the lowest impedance. And I remember whenever I'm referring to anti-resonance, I mean the highest impedance. <coughs> Although I'm sort of using resonance sometimes in a different way for K33, but uh, you know, be confident in the fact that for the equations I'm using uh, um, standard electrical terminology here. So uh, you'll notice that the resonance frequency is on the bottom, and you'll notice for the K33 resonator uh, that the anti-resonance frequency is often on the denominator. Uh, so for the KP mode, because it's a little more complicated, it doesn't follow a sinusoidal distribution, vibration distribution. Actually, it goes according to the Bessel function. Fortunately for us, Bessel function is very easily modeled in Excel. There's a function called Bessel J. Basically, if you if you type in this exact function here, Bessel J parentheses whatever you found for zeta comma zero divided by Bessel J z, whatever you found for zeta comma one, uh, this this will give you this J star value. From this J star value, you can calculate uh, the KP mode like that. A simpler way that people use to calculate the KP mode, and it doesn't give so much. Uh, <coughs> inaccuracy. However, uh, you ought not to use it because it's because it will reduce your material properties, and you want to pro provide the highest k squared possible. Because usually that's which I think in most cases that's that's always a good thing have a higher k squared value. I think, uh, but you could provide a kp squared effective, and the way to do that would be the resonance anti resonance frequency squared minus the resonance frequency divided by the resonance frequency squared. So this is a sh little shortcut to get you that value if you're lazy. But please don't be lazy and please use the equations. Uh, I made it sort of simple for you by giving you this polynomial fit and uh, you can also go to the table which is found in the IEEE standard. I think some other papers probably reprinted as well uh, but the IEEE standard on piezoelectricity electricity is a, is a good good place to look at that table and make your own fit if you don't believe me. <coughs> <coughs> but use this Bessel J function. It'll be good for you. All right. So step four is to determine the piezoelectric charge coefficient. But before we go to step four, remember that uh, in our analysis previously we got the S S three three D. So convert that to S three three E using your uh, Knowledge of the coupling coefficient. No, using your knowledge of the coupling coefficient, which you are, which you just solved for in the last slide. So, determine the piezoelectric charge coefficient uh, according to these equations. So, solve for the charge coefficient. I didn't solve it for you. Just solve for it. You know, you know this value. You know this one. You know this one. You know, you, you know. Let me just use the highlighter. You know all of these. So therefore, calculate this. You know all of these, so therefore calculate this. You know all of these, so therefore calculate, calculate this. Not so hard. So, <coughs> step five is determine the losses in resonance and anti resonance. <coughs> and I will save this discussion for the next part. <coughs>